God is love, and he who dwells in love abides in God. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service, and I ask that you rise as you are able and join with us in singing our opening hymn, Great Are You, Lord. Please rise as you are able, and I ask that you remain standing for the prayer of invocation followed by all praying, Lord. Hearts and minds to receive the divine guidance, the unconditional love, and the healing that we so need. Let our hearts be open with praise and gratitude, and may we send that energy forth to everyone within the universe that is open to receive at whatever level that they are capable of, and may we see each other as one family coming forth from that divine, creative, unconditional love to each experience our own soul's journey here in the physical realm to learn to love ourselves as we are, that divine spark, and to allow that love to flow through us to everyone that we encounter, no matter what the circumstances are in their individual lives. And in so doing, we serve God by serving others, by giving hope, not hate, by bringing peace and love, truly walking in the footsteps of the master teacher, Jesus. And we pray for all souls everywhere, those that are in hospitals, nursing homes, or homes alone. And those that feel they have no one to pray for them. May they feel this divine healing energy of their creator. And may that spark that revitalization of love and knowing within them, that they truly may join us in praying the prayer that the Master Teacher Jesus taught to the original disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from error. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. It is now, <clears throat> excuse me, that time of service that we declare our principles as accepted by the United Metaphysical Churches. And please do this in unison as they appear on the super screen. We believe in God as infinite intelligence. We believe that the phenomena of nature, both physical and spiritual, are the expression of infinite intelligence. We affirm that a correct understanding of such expression and the living in accordance therewith constitute true religion. We believe in personal responsibility and that we create our own happiness or unhappiness as we live in harmony or discord with natural, physical, and spiritual laws. We affirm that the existence and personal identity of the individual continues after leaving the physical world. We affirm that communication with spirit is a natural experience and is demonstrated through mediumship. We affirm that examples of prophecy and healing found in the Bible and other sacred texts are divine attributes found in all people. We believe that the highest morality is contained in the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We affirm that the doorway to reformation is always open to any soul here or hereafter. Our lecture today is titled, Love. And our scripture is 1 John chapter 3, 1, 
and 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. See how abundant the love of the Father is toward us, for he has called us his sons and made us. God is love, and he who dwells in love abides in God. May Spirit bless the reading of the scripture. As human beings, our greatest desire is to be loved unconditionally, but we spend far too much time looking for love in all the wrong places. In there, done it. We all have. It is a human condition, but at some point we're called to move beyond that human condition and step into the spiritual realm and bring the two together because that is the only way that we can demonstrate to ourselves and to others that each person is a creation of God, each mind is a thought of God, each life is a breath of God. The Spirit of God made us, and the breath of the Almighty has given us life. God, great is the love the Father has lavished on us loved us enough to name us and deem us to be the children of God. So how fortunate are we? Each of us came forth from divine mind in the energy of unconditional love. As a child of God, we are heirs to all that, all the good that is contained throughout the universe. The energy that gives birth to our thoughts and actions determines our ability to love, our quality of service to others, and the karmic effect that comes back to us in our individual lives each and every day. That's why the Bible has so many references to love and our ability to demonstrate that love and how we apply it in our actions with others and whether we make it conditional on the human level or do we express it unconditional. Only we can decide that in the moment. But it's obvious to others around us as they observe what plays out in our daily life by the karma that we walk through. You know, we can't just say, snap your finger and say it's gone. I'm not Samantha like the show, and, and neither are you. But it doesn't mean that we can't change it. We can, and that is what we all desire because that's what we came out of. So as an example of the scriptures in the Bible, I'm going to share a few with you today to validate love and its importance. The first being 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, which states, Though we speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and we have not love in our hearts, we become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though we have all the spiritual gifts of prophecy, the ability to understand all mystery and all knowledge, and have faith sufficient to move a mountain, but we do not have love in our hearts, we are nothing. And even if we bestow all our goods to feed the poor, and we even give our bodies to be burned, yet we have not love in our hearts. We gain nothing. That's how important love is to all people and the importance of demonstrating that each and every day. Then we go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21, which tells us that we love God because God first loved us and states that anyone who says, I love God, and will yet, and the next verse, or sentence, states that you hate, or dislike, have great disdain for any of your fellow human beings, is a liar. Because how can you truly say that you love God, whom you have never physically seen, and not love your fellow man who you have seen. If we look at our actions, we can find the fallacies. We can find our shortcomings. 
and see what we need to demonstrate to ourselves. Which brings forth another verse in the Bible that states, Why do we try to remove the splinter from our brother's eye when we have not yet removed the beam from our own? That one plainly shows that our love is limited. Our actions are self-serving because we have not yet reached that place within our own being, coming totally up to the heart chakra to function from. If you're functioning totally in lower chakras, you are truly functioning in the ego, which is conditional love, nothing more. We have a reason, a purpose. This commandment we have all received, that he who loves God should love his brother also. So as I stand before you today, I know that I have shortcomings. I probably have personality traits that many people do not like. And you don't have to like me, that's perfectly fine. But God has commanded that you should love me. So if you can love me, it's okay if you don't love me. And we should give our fellow human beings that freedom to express. The law of love is the creative source and power of all life. The realization of this law is the highest goal to be attained. Love is purifying. It is the power that lifts one's heart and soul to the highest spiritual awareness that we can ever achieve. The highest levels of consciousness can only be achieved through that unconditional love. So if we're not expressing it and allowing ourselves to experience it, we're denying ourselves the opportunity to be that which we come to be, the best us that we have within ourselves. In reality, there is only one love. When humans express divine love in limited ways, we create a separation in consciousness and our expression of love is personal instead of unconditional are universal. Living the law of love provides one with the freedom from negativity, jealousy, hate, resentment, and even the need to exact revenge on someone for the actions that we feel they have demonstrated to us. And what they actually demonstrated may have been the greatest love that the individual we're speaking about has the capability to express in the state of mind where they are. This freedom provides us with the opportunity to pursue positive goals, such as being at peace within our own being, to be, live in harmony, to experience happiness and contentment. By living this law, we can create a new and positive awareness not only for ourselves, but for others as well. And as that energy spreads out into the family and further out into the community, we are doing a great service for all of humanity. The love principle is the action of giving, and its reaction is re-giving. It is the constructive force of all forces. And the spectrum of love is patience, kindness, generosity, good-tempered, humility, courtesy, unselfishness, sincerity, and most of all, godlessness. All are qualities that promote soul growth and demonstrate unconditional love. When we make a conscious shift in our individual consciousness placed in the ego, our resident betrayer, our own personal Judas, under the authority of divine mind, there is a calm surrender, as unconditional love fills that void within. And we truly know the source of our own being. At that point, we feel that connection. <coughs> Excuse me. The development of divine love in individual consciousness has its place in demonstrating the law of abundance.
our supply in our individual lives. It will draw to us all that we require to make us happy and content. There we become conscious of our connection to the source and how to work that energy, how to use natural law to achieve our goals and to feel that divine love and to know that it is an attribute, an idea, and the one mind, infinite intelligence. And when we are in that state, we feel that connection. We know it, and we trust the guidance that we receive. God is love, and love is God, a state of being. We develop love in our hearts by asking daily that the infinite love of the Father be poured out upon us through prayer and meditation. We need to affirm it and affirm that we are one with it and express it at all times, saying, I exist in the perfect love of God. We don't have to work to earn it. We just have to be willing to allow it to flow through us and out to others. It becomes like breathing. It becomes a natural thing. And we are the greatest benefactor of our own actions. By establishing ourselves in the consciousness of divine love and expressing that love at all times, we fulfill the commandment to love our enemies and do good to those that hate us, even blessing those that curse us and praying for them that spitefully use us. When we love enough to use our spiritual gifts without thought of personal gain for the purpose of lessening the suffering of humanity, ransoming the souls of many, but especially our own, we experience the will of God, which always means greater love, freedom from oppression, greater self-expression, new and brighter experiences, and wider opportunities of soul growth and service to others, and life much more abundant. This was demonstrated by the life of John Powell, a professor at Loyola University in Chicago. John taught a the theology of faith class and this is where he first met and encountered a young man named Tommy, an unusual young man who turned out to be an atheist, but yet he was taking a course in theology. Tommy constantly objected to, smirked at, or whined about the possibility of a father figure or creator capable of loving humans unconditionally as he observed the actions of people around him that were not too favorable. And it was at the end of the course when Tommy turned in his final exam, he asked the professor in a, professor in a cynical tone, do you think I'll ever find God? Classes were over, so the professor decided to use a little shock therapy and emphatically replied, no. Why not, Tommy responded. I thought that was a product you were pushing. The professor allowed Tommy to get five steps away from exiting out of the classroom door. Then he called out to Tommy, Tommy, I don't think you will ever find God, but I am absolutely certain that God will find you. The professor was disappointed as Tommy walked out of the class and the professor's life without acknowledging the profound declaration that he felt he had made. After graduation, the professor received the sad news that Tommy had terminal cancer. And the professor felt the need to reach out to the young man because he did want to see him one more time, find out where he was in life and where his faith was, how he truly was. But before Tom, uh, the professor was able to reach out to Tommy, Tommy came to visit the professor. 
His body was badly wasted. His long, beautiful hair had all fallen out as a result of chemotherapy. But his eyes were bright, and his voice was firm as he said to the professor, for the first time in my entire life, I believe. The professor said, Tommy, I've thought about you so much, so often. I hear you are sick. To which Tommy replied, oh yes, I'm very sick. I have cancer in both lungs. It's a matter of weeks before I'm scheduled to go to the other side. The professor asked Tommy if he could talk about his sickness. And Tommy replied, sure, professor. What would you like to know? So what the professor said, what is it like to be only 24 and know that you are dying? It could be worse, the young man said. Like what, the professor asked. Well, like being 50 and having no values or ideals, or like being 50 and thinking that booze and making money are the real biggies in life. Professor, do you remember when I asked you if you thought I would find God and you said no, but he will find you? He's, Tommy said, I thought about that a lot. I thought my search for God was intense at that time, but when the doctors removed a, a lump from my groin and told me it was malignant, I got really serious about finding God. Then the malignancy spread to my vital organs, and I really began banging my fist on the bronze doors of heaven. But God did not respond. No one came out. Nothing happened. So eventually I quit. I decided at that time I really didn't care about God and afterlife or anything like that. I decided that I would spend what time I had left doing something that was more profitable for me. Then I thought about you in your class. I remembered something else you said. Essential sadness is to go through life without loving. So after pondering and meditating on that, I decided it would be almost equally as sad to go through life and leave this world without ever telling those people that you love that you love them. So I decided that I would begin with the most difficult person. I started with my dad. He was sitting in the TV room reading the newspaper when I approached and I said, Dad, I would like to talk with you. So with his reading glasses on, he peers over the top of the paper and said, well, talk. So I got my courage up and I said, Dad, it's really important. I need your full, undivided attention. I want you to know that I love you and how much that I have loved you. The newspaper flooded to the floor and my father did two things that I never remember him ever doing before. He cried as he hugged me and we talked all night even though he had to go to, to work the next morning. It felt so good to be close to my father, to see his tears, to feel his hug, to hear him say that he loved me. It was much easier with my mother and my little brother. Of course, they cried with me as we shared the things that we had been keeping secret from each other. My only regret is waiting so long to tell the people that I love, that I loved them. You were right, Professor. God didn't come to me when I pleaded or begged. I guess I was like an animal trainer, holding out a hoop, demanding things be done my way. But he found me even after I stopped looking for him. One day, I turned around, and there was God. The important thing is that God was there. The surest way to find God is not to make God the creator, 
a private possession, a problem solver, or an instant consolation in our times of need, but by opening ourselves to love. For each of us, the secret place of the Most High is in our own soul, where God dwells in eternal peace and infinite calm. Here we can walk on the waters of life, undisturbed by the waves of the storm raging around us. Divine companionship is ours for eternity, and peace that transcends all human confusion comes as we realize indeed we are God's children. God's love is the flame in our hearts, and we truly are the keepers of that flame. There is a poem titled, My Secret Garden, with an unknown author, but it speaks to the truth of our being and the great love our Creator has lavished upon us, the children of God, and I quote, I am God's child. And because I am God's child, I am a child of God. I think. And because I think, I create. And because I think and create, I choose to create light thoughts. Because I create light thoughts, I am full of light. I am wonderful, therefore I can love, succeed, and be the very best me that I can be. What more can anyone ask of any of us? Because that transcends all transgressions of the past, are the present and prevents future. May the Spirit bless you.